Okay, today I have the uh, great fortune to, first of all, get barked at by a dog named Bubbles, and secondly, <laughs> to talk to Mariel V. Jacobsons. Um, Mariel has been doing some really interesting work lately. She's uh, got a release coming out. Uh, there's a lot of activity uh, kind of buzzing around. Uh, her head right now. So um, with that, I am going to say hi to Mariel. Hi, Mariel. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm all right. Um, so rather than me uh, list out what all you're doing, why don't I have you tell people what you're doing? Okay, sure. Well, I just a couple weeks ago released a brand new album called Star Core on Thrill Jockey Records. And um, along with that, I've been touring for the past month or so in a few places and performing as a live audiovisual experience um, with Chuck Johnson on bass. And then I perform um, with violin, flute, voice, uh, mixing synthesizers, and um, as well as triggering the video. Also been working on some, some new videos after this first iteration, so continuing to work on videos with my Mac or my somatic instrument. Yeah, why don't you explain what that is? Because that is, uh, that kind of rolls off your tongue, macro somatic <laughs> instrument. <laughs> but most people won't know what the hell you're talking about. So it's why don't true. you explain a little bit? <laughs> it's true, I did make it up. I don't blame anyone for scratching their head when I say it. <laughs> And sometimes even after I describe it, they're like, I think I understand, but I'd like to see it. Right. <laughs> so the it's a visual music instrument that I built, and it translates sounds into the motion of water or a fluid. And then I capture that at the macro photographic scale, so very, very close up. And so the result, and also there's um, programmed LEDs that are part of the instrument itself. So what you end up having is sound being translated directly into light. Right. Why don't we just right away, let's go ahead and, and give a web address so people can go and check out the images that this thing produces. So where's the best place for them to see this in action? Yeah, if you go to my website, mariellejacobsons.com, you do have to figure out how to spell that. Um, hopefully right. Google can help you a little bit with that. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I'll, I'll make sure that I put a link on the, uh, on the show notes as well. Okay, yeah. The, yeah, the funny thing is that there's K and O's in the last name, <laughs> okay. and it gets everybody every time, but um, it's actually Latvian in origin, if that helps anyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now when I saw the some of the video that I saw this, I really want to see this live because some of the video that I saw was mind bending because you show shots of how you do it, and then I see the macro work, and I don't know if there's like visual illusions or how much processing you're doing, but just amazing stuff comes out of it. It's crazy and. You know, some stuff which I assume is like being generated because of the way that the lights are interacting and sometimes maybe shadows or so. I have no idea. There was some yeah. amazing stuff coming out of that. How, oh, how much of a you. surprise was the result? Or is this the kind of thing where you're on the 80th iteration of making the thing? There's always, there's always surprises. There's very little that's 100% reproducible on it from from moment to moment so there's for me personally working with it the instrument it's um, inculcating a sense of wonder at the natural environment and the processes that are happening around us all the time and so I'll look at it and you know uh, be amazed <laughs> uh, over and over again and um, so I'm really glad that that amazement is translating through the images yeah, it really it really was. I was I was kind of floored because it's a simple concept, but the way that you've implemented it, it's it's clear that uh, you've done something special because the result is pretty fantastic. 
Now oh, let's, thank you. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about this, uh, the album that you just put out, uh, Starcore. Mm -hmm. um, I had a chance to listen to it. It's really quite quite enjoyable. I had heard the one of the earlier albums that you did, Glass Canyon. Uh huh. Um, I had heard that, and to me, that sounded like some instrumentation and some acoustic instruments, and kind of like processing a bunch of stuff through Macs or other digital means. You know, it kind of sounded computer musicy. Mm -hmm. um, this new album doesn't it sounds like some kind of really weird acoustic and analog mix but it seems like there's very little at least to my ears it came across as, as being very much less computer music-y and I'm wondering why that would be because actually um in the Glass Canyon album you actually kind of list it as being sort of like violin and analog synths you don't even really talk about it being that processed yeah you know you don't say anything like that with the current one but to me i was i i found it really rich and organic sounding was there a big change in instrumentation or just recording process or did you just find a different composition compositional track that led to that or am i making it up oh yeah well that's that's an interesting um an interesting comment, which I haven't actually heard before. So okay. Glass Canyon, I do um, consider it mainly violin and synthesizers. There is a little bit of max processing on the violin here and there, but the main explorations are more um, in the timbral realm. So it's interesting, though, that it um, comes across as more digital and yeah. sound. I do think that the new album focuses on a wider array of instruments and is more grounded in their those acoustic elements, um, whereas the violin on Glass Canyon is a little bit more isolated. I think it's just violin and Fender Rhodes might be the only two instruments on there oh, um, besides that. synthesizers, so, um, which also appear on uh, Starcore, however, that's also accompanied by bass and voice and flute, of course, which is much more overtly melodic. I think that part of that might also be the style of the melodic style of Glass Canyon is much more subtle. Um, yeah. Well, may, that might be why it kind of came across as computer music -y too, to my ear, you mm -hmm. know, where the new thing is, I don't know, melodic is actually a great way to put it, so... I did notice the voice being used in in Starcore. Is that have have you used voice before in in your recordings? Uh no, actually. Well, there was I think some some backing vocals of some like oohs and ahs on one date palms track, but it was really really buried in the mix. Uh -huh. Um but so never um never in the forefront as a main melodic element. We can certainly say that. Right. And so for, for me, it's really the first time using my voice. So how, how weird was that? Oh, it, very, very strange. Um, <laughs> I definitely went through a lot of back and forth. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, using voice is so loaded. It just, you know, yeah. everybody's perceptions of it are going to be so much richer because of our our humanness right. <laughs> um, and adding that that human element and language is so just so loaded and right. um, so I definitely considered very carefully and wanted to approach it in a very minimalist way so that it wouldn't be overwhelming it would kind of almost be like another instrument rather than voice as the leading element it's just just like the, the violin or treating it like the violin or the flute yeah, I mean, to to be clear, you're not singing, uh, so, or you know, you're not uh, singing a song. You're uh, you are using it really as kind of a ambient instrument. It's it's really cool. It's a nice addition. I have to. Oh, say. thank you. All of these kind of things really, what it kind of leads to is this kind of really complex picture of an artist. You're doing visual work. You've worked in. You've worked with the Dave Palms in a band type environment. You've done these solo releases where you're kind of experimenting along multiple different axes. 
I'm always curious, and one of the things I like doing in my podcast is exploring where people have come from, how they got to be the artists that they are. And in your case, I'm really curious about it because it, it seems like you're very accomplished in multiple realms, and I'm wondering how you got there. Um, well, I definitely started on the violin as my main creative focus from the early, early very early age of four. <laughs> um, and so I came at that point, I entered into the world of kind of serious classical violin study and continued along that path for a while. And that also included the piano and whatever other instruments I could convince my parents to, uh, <laughs> to buy for me. Right. <laughs> so I was, I was pretty voraciously into um, performing music at that time growing up, throughout um, growing up. And it didn't really come across creating my own, composing my own music until much later, I would have to say that would be in college, actually. And um, in college, I was started off as a piano performance major and pre-med double major, ended up dropping the med, but still continuing to take a lot of science classes, which were a big inspiration to me and my work, and I think still are. I also injured my hand, and so I ended up not doing as much piano performance as I um, had intended or dreamed of at a certain point, and found the electronic music lab in the basement of the Cleveland Institute of Music, got started using MIDI and some synthesizers and that that was much more um, interesting to me than kind of fighting against the uh, repertoire <laughs> right well it's interesting you, yeah the earlier centuries <laughs> right it's interesting you say that though because you jumped from an instrument that has a almost a strict marching orders for the repertoire that you learn over over time to a set of instruments where there's practically no set repertoire. Everything has to be composition. And so you were probably, you know, were pretty well pushed into that. Yeah. And I was delighted at that time. <laughs> I was <laughs> I was having a lot of friction with my teacher about repertoire. And I started improvising on the piano and started composing at that time. And I really wanted to be focusing on modern music you know, 21st century music and not music of old. And, you know, she did, she was also a contemporary piano performer. And so I was like, you know how to play this stuff. Teach me that. Can right. we forget about the other stuff? Right, right. <laughs> and it just, she's just like, it just doesn't work that way. You know, We could sprinkle in a little Stockhausen here and there, but you can't just focus on it. So that kind of bummed me out. So when when I ended up getting redirected, I was very inspired by the freedom, you know, went went from there to um, to Paris for a year, actually, to study computer music. And so continued on that realm over to Mills College, where I got to start exploring more of my ideas of creating instruments and working with Macs and creating installations and more experiments in the, the broader sense of artistic production, um, as well as honing in on my um, sound and music skills. Right, right. Now, do you mind me asking, you said that you injured your hand and that kind of led to some of the changes that, that you faced. What, what kind of injury was it? Oh, it was, we can blame it on bar talk. <laughs> You probably wouldn't be yeah. the first person. So Yeah, Bartok, you know, I guess he had really big hands. Oh, oh <laughs> and, um, you know, I was really trying to play the music percussively. And oh. I was having a lot of fun playing the music percussively. Right. But unfortunately, my body was not, not having so much fun sure. with the results. And uh, so because it was a... Because it was happened on the piano, um, even over months of therapy, and it just it wouldn't it wouldn't go away. Now, um, I'm I'm interested to hear that you uh, you went to Mills, and that kind of lit you into 
into instrument building because that seems to be kind of a common thread between a lot of people that I talk to. You know, certainly um, like Ben Bracken and Ashley and and uh, these folks. You know, they they're definitely into instrument building. Was there something about the program there that is kind of specifically introduces you to that as a practice? Well, I think that uh, actually there is quite a bit of support there um, right now for instrument building. When I was there, there was support, but maybe not as many structured classes about that. But um, what really got me to go there was that I was looking for programs that weren't so so very uh, strictly defined as to what composition was and what the creative process for composers should be to get your master's degree. And so that kind of open-endedness and the ability to explore creating things, physical objects as well as software objects was what, it, you know, what what was exciting to me. So I do think that a lot of the instrument building itself came from the community that was there. Mm-hmm. For example, my friends Ben Bracken and Agnes Shellog and other amazing artists that I was there at the same time as who um, were very inspired by works of art that connected people in through space. You know, together we discovered, you know, or I discovered James Terrell, for example, through through this community. And mm-hmm. that kind of blew my mind. <laughs> and I was like, how can we create a sonic experience that could parallel that level of perception, uh, play with perception as a James Terrell piece might, for example. Sure. So yeah, I think that a lot of the, the interest, in, interest in, in instrument building to come from the place and time that I was there as well, as the freedom and what you could explore there. And the varied instrument, I mean, the faculty there has so many different interests and layers to their interests. And um, it was also fun to be able to go to the California College of Arts and take a class there in interface design, uh, which was actually where I built what I consider my first instrument, which was the self-oscillating violin. Right. Yeah, I saw a video. I saw a video piece of that, and you know, I, I saw that, and then I saw uh, some videos that you have on your site. One which is like you were at a conference where you had like a little speaker with a thing, and I just came to realize that an awful lot of your, particularly your performance work seems to be oriented on this idea of like vibration and sympathetic vibrations or activated vibration. What's the fascination? Where did that come from? I mean, what was like the first time you saw something move like that? And you said, oh, there's, there's something there. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, yeah, it was probably around the time that that first video that you saw. Yeah, I can't quite imagine what the first time itself was that I thought that um, cymatics would be an interesting thing to explore. But I might have been for that that particular class, which was focused on um, media arts and video production and stuff like that, where I wanted to start to think about the visual elements. That seemed like a direction that was really interesting to me in its ability to... um, draw people into the sound. I was starting to work with minimalist violin and uh, just sine wave synthesizers, which was my early Darwin's Bitch project. And I think that 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 type of work lends itself well to cymatics, working with sine waves already and trying to pare sounds down to their simplest elements. Right. What is the thread then that kind of took some of these basic these basic elements and turned in because the the thing you're working with now your uh and i have to actually look it up here the macro cymatic visual music instrument Mm -hmm. that's actually a pretty complex structure you know you've got uh you've got this pressed it's a rosin based like platform right that holds some water but then it's it's a pretty complex set of lights all the way around it and over it, mm-hmm. you use what? You use just like a standard uh, DSLR camera for capturing, transmitting, or something else? 
Let's start with the soundboard okay, of the that's, instrument. Yeah. So that's <laughs> <know>. yeah. <laughs> because it's like there's so many there's so many moving pieces here. I, it's like you know you started off with like a violin on a pedestal and you somehow ended up with to this contraption. I'm trying to imagine like the through line that connects those things. <laughs> yeah, I uh, to me I think that the the through line is trying to create a a visual object that can also be thought of and is is an actual uh, musical instrument in its own in its own right and so thinking of things both in a sculptural way and in uh, their with their sonic properties in mind and so i think that that's one one aspect and to talk a little bit more about the instrument the macrocymatic instrument itself it did start off with wood in a more traditional instrument fashion where it was I carved actually a little divot to create a little pool for the liquid so I actually carved that by hand you know very much thinking of myself as an instrument builder in the traditional sense um, like a violin maker would sure carving the back of the violin and um, and taking cues from that that you know the sonic properties of wood and particularly I was tried out a bunch of different types of wood and cedar was working really well and i was like oh well, i guess that makes sense you know a lot of uh instruments are built with cedar and now i can see why right. <laughs> it does have a flatter frequency response um than some of the other more porous woods or the really hard woods that are just very difficult to carve and work with right, right. so i learned a lot about that <laughs> you know i started to start to move away from thinking of it as a more and actually that first one also had a string on top so to complete that thread of the more traditional instrument and creating a sound object with it the first version of the macrocymatic instrument did have a string on top with a bridge and it was carved from wood so (laughs) right so it was like a proto violin at that point yeah or meta violin (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> then, um, and that was created at the Drescher Ensemble Residency. That was the first time that I was working with wood and okay. had the great opportunity to have access to the wood shop as well as their performance space. So I could go back and forth, modify the instrument, and then go hook it up with my camera and see the result right away and then go back and forth. And that was so helpful because it is a rather complex creation. Um, There's so many different elements, learning the camera, then later on came the lights. Uh, So after the woodworking, I was creating videos at another residency called Jurassi. And along the road, I had an idea that I was actually creating certain types of shots visually because of the wood grain. And there were moments where I didn't want to see a wood grain in the background. And so the thought came to create the instrument to be clear. And I was like, well, how's that possible? How's that even going to work? Is it going to vibrate properly? Um, I don't know. I'm going to have to just try it out. And so I did some research into some materials and found casted resin and I decided to create a, a mold that resembled the wood instrument. And I, so I molded it with clay, um, ceramic clay, and then um, poured in the, the resin and let it dry and then popped it out. And was like, all right, let's see if you can vibrate properly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely different, but it, uh, it, it doesn't vibrate perhaps as evenly in its frequency ranges as the wooden instrument. But what it allows me to do visually is far greater. Sure, it doesn't necessarily have an imprint that it presses into every image. Exactly. Or the imprint's just very different. It actually mm. looks very um, space-like, which I love. Oh, <laughs> for, cool. I was working on the videos for StarCore, so right, right. I thought that was... Um, that was another just stroke of amazing wonder that the shots that I could get on there started to look um, like interstellar landscapes to me. So what do you what do you use as a transducer to get the to excite the board? Yeah, it's just um, a small transducer that I stick on the bottom of the board. There's 
not too many that are created right now, and I can't remember the brand name of it right now. I know I got it from partsexpress.com. Okay, so if you, right. if you look for um, an exciter transducer on partsexpress.com, you will find the like uh, one and only stick-on <laughs> <laughs> transducer that's um, out on the market right now. Okay. All right. Well, that's... <laughs> I, not, we need to say I bought like 12 of them at least. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, because it's just, you know, it's one of, it's, it's sort of an oddity when you actually start thinking thinking about you know thinking about this as an instrument all of a sudden it's not just the parts that you see but all the parts that make it work too right and i was curious yeah. to know you know what even worked for a trans you know if you if you had a you know just a big speaker or if you had literally a physical transducer yeah it definitely wants to be vibrated directly physical um, excited, right phys- yeah physical contact is is pretty important is crucial actually i mean the sound would have to be so loud to be coming through the air only right and move and move the actual um uh, soundboard enough to see to see the water also moving sure. so there's definitely a lot of factors involved. It's funny, the, the wooden instrument, too, is so touchy about, like, the humidity of the room, the temperature. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so that was, you know, a learning experience of trying to perform live visuals on that instrument and just, you know, knowing that every time I was going to set it up, it was going to want to be set up a little bit differently. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. So um, the nice thing about having the resin casted, it has a plexiglass base, is that once it's set up, I pretty much know uh, how it's going to vibrate. So that at least takes one factor down a little bit. <laughs> sure, right? Yeah, because I imagine it's like it, it could be it could be endless uh, the variations that you run into, and not always positive variations. Oh yeah, definitely. There's uh, there was a lot of frustration with just uh, getting getting it to vibrate properly and reproducibly. Right. <laughs> and I do feel like the latest version can do that. In, in a much better way so it's still very touchy to set up so i don't travel with it <laughs> very i've played like a i've played a couple times live vi- with live visuals um but a lot of the time most of the time now i'm working with pre-recorded video files sure. that are synchronized to the audio that you're right. hearing oh, okay. and to me that i think is the the most reasonable way until I get a an awesome team to tour with me. <laughs> you can just what you can just have is make sure that there's a mold in every city. And you just right, <laughs> right, right. Just create it exactly to spec. That's right, right. Send have it in your rider. You know, right. <laughs> so uh, now this thing also you've got a, about a zillion lights surrounding this thing, and you you make a point of of mentioning that they're programmable led lights yeah um, how how much manipulation of lights do you do do you have like a big programmatic programmatic system that kind of ties to the music sensing as well or is it fairly simple brightness management what how do you because again looking at the result i have no height i have no idea how what i see as a physical device gets to the end result so I'm just like curious about how, what are the influences of each of these pieces of material? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, you know, I have to just say that I love that about it, that you, you can't really, you know, I, I love to talk about the instrument in a very um, simplified way because the end result, all the technology that's underneath it kind of doesn't even matter at that right. point it's really just it the experience of right. it yeah. um but i do love also to get into the nitty-gritty and i have so many ideas about uh all the other things that i want to create with it so the lights the programmable lights are actually a very new addition as well they came around just when i was at jirasi this spring i had been working with fixed lights and gels before so okay. just you know gooseneck leds from like ikea right, right. and so also very difficult to get the same angle of light, the same, t- you know, same, the, the right, the, just the right way every time. Or if you move it, it's just going to be a big jumble. I was like, I need to. And also the hues that I was getting from the gels are super saturated all the time. And not, just not a lot of, and not a lot of definition. I couldn't change the hues 
for different parts mm-hmm. of songs, you know. Not so I was a just lot like, of subtlety, right? Not a lot of subtlety. I had so I was like, I need to, I need to figure this out. I hadn't worked with LEDs before, uh, but luckily, it's a great time to start working with LEDs because yeah. there's so many um, awesome products out there right now and um, libraries. So I ended up getting some LEDs and hooking them up. And um, uh, what I ended up doing was just writing programs per each part of a song and creating like beats per minute synchronization, depending on what song it was and that might coincide with shifts in hue or direction of the light or the, having the light patterns moving up and down um, the matrix of LEDs. So everything that I've been programming so far has been not as perhaps elegant as it could be if I built a system, uh, a more interactive system, which is on my to-do list. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But um, for the immediate moment, I'm just programming each song individually in a way, or every every part of a song individually as its own program and uploading that um, to an Arduino and um, just letting that run and recording it. Right. And then how much processing do you do of the video image on the back end? Um, not a ton. There's a little bit of layering that'll happen. A little bit of color correction here and there is I might decide this hue or this layer looks better with this layer if the hues are a little bit uh, matched in a different way. But um, I try to keep it pretty, pretty close to what the instrument's giving because technical limitations to be honest so i am using a dslr a canon d60 which is not a very very sensitive um, camera but the light is traveling through very very long tube um, Mm -hmm. in order to get the macro photographic effect and so the amount of light that's actually reaching the sensor is very very small even though i have all these bright leds shining on the water and so the there is a lot of limitations as to what kind of shots I can make and look good and the amount of processing that I can do. And I don't honestly think that it needs a lot of right. processing necessarily, but um, there are a lot of sh- kinds of shots that I'd like to do um, if I only had about $8,000 for a camera. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was playing around with a lot of different camera gear this summer while I was making um, the video for white sparks. And I was, I had some ideas for shots and I was like, you know, reaching what I think is the limits of this camera. I don't think it's the limits of what I could do with this instrument. I think it's the camera. And um, I realized that it was going to be a very big difference in price from to, to get the the kind of results that I was um, imagining. Sure. Um, so, but it's pretty amazing what I could do with that little rig. I just, it was a few years ago, I bought that camera just thinking, I want to do this macro stuff. I need something to play around with. This seems like a good camera. Right. <laughs> and it's kind of amazing how the images that I, that I get with it, I'm, I'm really impressed with that, that piece of gear. <laughs> you know, as you say, to go through the macro uh, photographic process, it's going through an awful lot of lenses to maybe a not completely super sensitive sensor maybe sort of the artifacts of that actually are some of the some of the charm factor too yeah yeah it does um one of the nice things about the camera is that it has this kind of fuzzy almost filmic quality which um if if you get maybe the latest and greatest uh 4k hg camera doesn't have that um doesn't have those nice fuzzy almost filmic um look to it um Mm. but it might be able to go to a really high iso but (laughs) (laughs) Um, so trade-offs yeah but you know it's so there are there are definitely some qualities of the camera that i know that i'm playing to and um i i appreciate um how much it can do with kind of so little I, it's really just one lens uh, which I actually had since um, since I was a girl in high school taking my f- photography class in darkroom class and I actually spent a lot of time in the darkroom um, in high school and um, I had this 
I had, you know, a Canon camera and a few lenses. And this is actually one of the lenses that I've had since then. Um, mm. That's the lens that I use on a bellows um, in oh, order wow. to create this effects. I so. <laughs> do you ever do you ever miss uh, the old days of dark rooms and playing with chemicals? Yeah, I mean, there was a moment when I got to Jurassi and I um, I was I was just settling and I was like, oh, hey, where should I put? I have all these cases from all this equipment, you know, <laughs> and they were like, oh, if you just go up those stairs, um, you can put it in that room. And I like opened the door and I was like, this is a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting my cases in a dark room and who nobody told me there was a dark room here. I was like, man, I would have brought a whole different set of stuff. Um, right. Because the, the thought of making some of these macrocymatic photographs, I've been making also photographs on the instrument, making prints with them and showing them at galleries. And I've been very excited about that direction. And the fact that I had a dark room just steps away from me, but didn't have any of the materials to um, execute anything with that was a little bit disappointing. Sure. I think that the effect of the effect of actually creating your photographs and the the difference in process where develop, you're developing your film and is something that's so so physical and tangible and um, to me it still has a very very nostalgic <laughs> feeling. Right. <laughs> I do wonder what I could do now with all the all the work that I've been doing visually. What what would happen? So I guess uh, next residency maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think about it though, the whole process of it photography if if you consider it that the processes that go behind any kind of artwork all of the processes are are part of where the artist can have an effect going from film technology to digital basically lopped off half of the photographic photographic process you still take mm -hmm. the pictures but the whole process of manipulating the stored image into the real image that's mm -hmm. largely gone that process that part of that opportunity for the artist to, to affect the result it's largely gone well there's photoshop for that oh yeah <laughs> it's true though it's it's now done in that digital realm and um seems a lot different the, to me yeah it's it is very different um i think that you know, when you're manipulating light directly, there's a, your the the understanding and the results that you can get are very different. Right, um, right. So I want to talk a little bit more about the music and the composition work that you do. Um, in the end, you took an approach that uh, was an art approach rather than a music approach. So you got uh, your MFA at Mills rather than trying to get your music doctorate or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I took a similar approach, as, as have a number of people I know. And I think that that's becoming sort of an accepted and, and an interesting way for someone to go if their view of composition is more complex than uh, placing new notes on sheets of staff paper, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's definitely what... Um what heralded me over to Mills was the fact that there was a program. And at that time, there were a few other programs as well who um, allowed the uh, musician and composer to take a more artistic approach. I do think that there's even more options for that these days as um, there's a lot more also trade schools for, you know, audio production as well as art as music and uh, sound work being incorporated into art schools in new ways and so that's I mean I think that's a pretty exciting development for for new artists who are just trying to figure out the way that they might want to work with different materials and sound might just be one of those materials right so when you're doing your composition work what what are the things that drive you um, are you driven by timbre? Are you driven by uh, the compositing process of bringing multiple uh, different instrumentation together? Um, are you driven by melodic lines or percussion, percussive lines? What are the things that 
that really kind of draw a composition out of you? Well, I do think a, a little bit of all of the above, <laughs> of course, in their own way. I think that my sense of rhythm, because I am a, I started on the violin, and I do believe that that was very formative to my approach to music and continues to be um, to my approach to composition. The, the focus is on melody more than uh, rhythm. So I've always been a little more focused on the frequencies that you're hearing and the execution of those frequencies, not necessarily as much with beats and meters, although, of course, that's a part of the music. Somehow my brain's always been more focused on the nuances of timbre as part of the performance and part of the sound that you're creating. I think that having that kind of having that background and focus to from a from a young age as someone who focused on small details and sounds in particular because melodic it's a slightly more pure tone of the violin and really focusing on the subtleties of bowing to morph timbres. I think that those are some of the formative elements of uh, my compositional style and what um, what drives me. I think that feeling, you know, playing the violin, you feel close to the sound. You feel like you're inside the sound and all of the details of the sound are all around you and you're inside of it. And I think that a lot of my composition is um, expanding that to to new timbres and new ways of creating those those feelings for and to share as well. And what does that what does that process look like? Do you like do do you sit down and imagine melodic lines and write them down, or do you improvise a bunch and capture it and look for look for nuggets in that, or mm -hmm. Uh, you know. Yeah, well, I do actually usually start with um, synthesizer, and okay. that's um, the basis for. And I then I start to usually within um, long synthesizer improvisations, I'll find melodic elements, rhythmic elements that I want to kind of bring out or um, imagine happening, and I'll start to create those. Um, with different instruments. Sure. And so I, it's, this album also started with some samples on, of, of um, the Mills old Moog that they have, which is one of the early prototypes, like a 3P, I think it's, it is. And I went in there one summer evening. I was, I was actually teaching there at the time, so I had access and I just recorded a whole bunch of different improvisations with it. Um, a lot of those ended up being used on the album a couple years later because they were developed into these songs. They came out of the Moog. I mean, you'll hear the Moog all throughout the album if you um, can can recognize it. Um, but it is the backbone of uh, many of the songs on it. Oh, that's that's really interesting. So, are you a person that like kind of keeps the tape running all the time, or do you? explore and then try and remember bits and pieces that that hit you well i uh i think that i i like to explore and then when i feel like i'm in a good spot hit record and right. see what else happens with that there are some certainly some ideas that i have of uh, that i'd like to explore for example where i was like oh well i really like the way that the violin and the synthesizers are interacting in this song i'd like to see if i can recreate that with the flute and this other synthesizer on this other song and so there are some more perhaps cerebrally driven uh, mm. ideas of composition as well that happen sure um so what other than the mills uh 3p what uh synthesizers do you primarily use yeah, I have a Prophet 600 at home, which is a very, very funny beast. Yeah. <laughs> it was the first, I think it was the first synthesizer with MIDI, first if I'm not mistaken. MIDI. Yep, yep. you're right. It's very funky. <laughs> <laughs> it has a lot of character, and really, I think nothing else sounds like it. As a sound designer, I like the fact that it has a very unique sound and if I'm looking for something that's going to for example cut through the mix or sound very different than everything else 
as uh, you can you could promise you can reach for the p600 <laughs> it's not going to sound like anything else right. any software that you have any any hardware <laughs> other analog synthesizers no it's just its own thing and so i love it for that i also have this um, analog solution sem synthesizer um, mm. which is a mono synth i love it i love the filter on it I think it reminds me of the Moog and the way that the filter sings. Mm -hmm. That is definitely been a mainstay of my a lot of my solo work for a long time. I think Glass Canyon has a lot of, of that synthesizer on it as well. I also have a Dave Smith Instruments Pro 2, um, which is a more recent acquisition. And I love that one because of its all of the possibilities and timbres that it's capable of. If you want something that's very noisy, sound designy, um, if you have an idea, pretty much I think you can create it on that synthesizer. It's so sure. versatile. If you want a pure sine wave tone, you can get that too. Um, right. So it has a, a modulation matrix that you can create almost anything with. And so its versatility is is huge. And then I also had, was lucky enough to borrow. Um, Chuck Johnson's modular synth to use on the album as well um, for some other stuff. Okay. So, and also in Glass Canyon, I got to borrow a modular synth from my friend uh, and coworker Thomas Day. So I've had the the fortune of having uh, some friends with some uh, nice modular gear <laughs> uh, <laughs> since I um, haven't haven't invested in that direction my, on my own. But luckily, I get to play around with it a lot. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. So you use a lot of acoustic instruments. You somehow you ended up playing the flute, even though you, you you did this violin to piano thing. But you never told me how you even got the flute. But I think it's <laughs> cool that you're doing flute. Um, but you do these acoustic instruments. Do you ever do you ever run the acoustic stuff through the synths, or do those kind of live in a separate in two different headspaces for you? Mm, that's a that's a really good question. Um... So I did actually start playing the flute, I'll just let you know, in uh, middle school band. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so in order to participate in my middle school music program, I needed to pick an instrument that wasn't the violin or piano because they didn't have an orchestra. Right. And um, so I picked the flute and then I got kicked out of band. So <laughs> then I didn't play the flute anymore until date palms. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> But um, so instruments being um, processed by synthesizers. So I, I explored some of that in um, my earlier work, especially I would be processing the violin through Max and Super Collider. I think that for me, some of the more more interesting things that I was finding was perhaps not necessarily how the process was influencing both sounds at the same time, but how the two sounds were interacting in the acoustic space. So that's been a focus of mine for a while now. And so I think that my approach tends to be as, as a mixing engineer as well, um, knowing that I can create interactions between the sounds by how they're placed in acoustic space. Sure. It's interesting. It's one of those things that I, I explored quite a bit. And then I was kind of like, uh, okay, I think I want to just do it this way. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I mean, if, if nothing else to it, it seems like, you know, because I'm a guitar player as well as doing a lot of work with synthesizers and software, obviously. I actually find that playing my guitar, especially an acoustic guitar, through a synthesizer where there should be like the opportunity for lots of timbral fun, I like lose the connection with the physicality of the instrument somehow. I mean, I can mm. still feel it, but somehow the vibrations that I feel against my chest no longer really match the vibrations I hear coming out of a speaker. And the whole mm -hmm. thing just becomes disconnected to me. Right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. for me, there's like, a, it's, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work to try and do that. Like, multi-level piping i guess yeah i think that um i wonder if that's that's part of part of what i experienced i think that when i first started playing the electric violin i was just so excited by all the different timbres <laughs> that i could finally do <laughs> right, right. went really bonkers with you know the, of course the first thing that i did beside you know just tweaking building all sorts of crazy effects in like max and super collider was getting like a i got this one one guitar pedal which is um 
a wah and ring wad all in one. Oh, dear. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Did they actually call it the train wreck? I hope so. <laughs> it was, I can't remember what it was called, like the snarling dog, I think. <laughs> okay, of course. Of course. And you couldn't wait to take your pretty, your, your, all those years that your mom paid for violin lessons, and you had to yeah. pump it through a snarling dog, right? Oh, yeah. That's yeah, awesome. that was I think was probably my first pedal. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, we need to journey up this violin. <laughs> it's, time. it's time. Enough with the pretty enough right. with the pretty pretty. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my final question here for you has to do with uh, with performance. You said that you're you've been doing a little bit of touring lately. Uh, doing that kind of stuff, and uh, you've been you've been touring with uh, with someone that plays bass, right? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, Chuck Johnson. Mm-hmm. All right. So, what if somebody goes to one of your shows? What what are they going to experience? Is it gonna Is it going to include the imagery? Um, is it? In, do you do like songs off the album, or do you do improvisational things? Uh, I used to be in a group where they call it comprovisation, where it's like composed improvisation mixed, right? Mm, what, how do you mm-hmm. how do you approach taking the things you do and bringing it into a live environment? And since I started to work with visuals, uh, everything got a little bit more complicated. <laughs> um, but um, in general, my my goal is an immersive audiovisual experience of the album as this performance. And so um, you'll see videos that are synchronized to the sounds that you're hearing and the synthesizers that are being played back. You'll also see me performing on flute and voice and violin, as well as doing real time mixing of songs and um, jamming with Chuck Johnson on bass. And so there's elements of comprovisation um, <laughs> in my process. I think always there has been. Since I've been performing my own music, I've always had elements of, of areas where which are pretty fixed or have a more clear idea of what I want to do and areas that allow the moment to kind of take its own shape. With this particular material, I am playing songs off the album because of the, I am tied in the end to the length of certain synthesizer samples, which is just how, what I, a decision that I made that having synchronized visuals to the sound was very important to me. I think that that then, you know, creates a complexity with how much improvisation room you have in the, in the time domain. And so I've been working a lot with creating different layers of videos that allow me to kind of move between sections in a more fluid way and I'm still working on them so <laughs> yeah. I'm just working on a new video uh, this weekend and you know looking forward to um, you know taking what I've learned and taking that to the next round of shows that we'll be doing so yeah, that sounds great well I look forward to being able to see see you uh, do a live show it's got to be incredible so oh thank you so much <laughs> All right, uh, and just as we wrap up here again, MarielleJacobsons.com is uh, where people can go to see see and hear some of your work. Do you have a Bandcamp type site or someplace where people can buy your stuff, or do they just need to go to their local record store? What's what's the best way for people to get access to your music? Oh yeah, well, um, the latest album as well as probably Day Palms albums as well can be found in, in the record stores and online at the Thrill Jockey website. And I do have a my own web store on my uh, website as well. So if you make your way to MarielJacobsons.com, you can there's a little store button there. And I do have a band camp as well, which is uh, MarielJacobsons.bandcamp.com. So you, if you're into that and would prefer to just do a download, for example. And also there's some other nuggets of um, some older stuff that you might not have heard of and if you want to check out um darwin's bitch for example um yeah which has nothing to has has nothing to do with me i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> no i know we had to bring that in yeah i'm right, glad you took the bait <laughs> <laughs> that's right all right um fantastic uh thanks a lot for spending the time we've blown through this this hour and 
uh, in record time, it seems. Uh, but thank you so much for spending time talking and exploring some of this history and uh, some of your vision for how to do art. It's really fascinating. Oh, thanks, Darwin. It was a pleasure. Many thanks to Mary Alfred for spending the time to talk about her work. It's really fantastic stuff. If you get a chance, head over to maryalljacobsons.com and take a look at the video. Uh, that instrument is stunning. Um, beyond that, I want to thank you very much for listening, for continuing to share this with your friends. And uh, just keep in touch if you need anything or if you have any ideas for people to interview. Please write me at ddg at cycling74.com. Other than that, I want to thank you again and catch you later.